The making of this computer will be divided into two iterations. In the first iteration we will construct a slightly reduced version and it will be built around a breadboard and some euroboards. It will demonstrate the feasibility of the proposed design. The second iteration includes proper PCBs, mechanics and a correct form factor. That will be the real thing. First I'll show what the final architecture will look like and then I'll take a step back and describe the construction in iteration 1. The system is divided into three major parts. The core contains the CPU, memory and control logic. It has everything together and it's acting as a hub for the information transfer in the system. It sits between the two other parts of the system. The front side is organized around the user interface bus to which there is a set of user interface boards attached. These boards represent buttons, switches, LEDs and other controls to the user in a fashion that is similar to the 8800. The reason for making several boards and not one, as on the Altair, stems from the decision to make the front panel flexible and reconfigurable. The purpose of these boards is only to interact with the user and not the environment. Such environment interaction is assigned to the expansion boards, which reside on the back side of the computer. Expansion boards are exactly what it sounds like, that is, cards for audio, video, storage, communication, etc. These boards are attached to the core system via the expansion board bus. If we break down the structure into some more detail, we can see that the aim is to have 16 expansion boards organized into two different backplane buses. 12 user interface boards organized in two different user interface buses with 4 and 8 slots respectively and that the core structure is broken down into four boards that is the main board, the extended main board, the backplane boards 1 and 2. The reason for this division of the buses and the core boards is mainly a practical one. It will be evident later when we discuss the casing and submit the PCBs to manufacturing. There are limitations of the sizes of the PCBs and the 3D printed items. Let's focus on the user interface for a moment. Do you remember the Altair organization of the front panel? It had lots of switches and LEDs. The Alt 6502 is heavily inspired by this design. Look at this initial sketch of the user interface. It's organized into five different sections. First, there is the status section. It contains LEDs for the interrupt, NMI, instruction fetch and the clock. And it's also possible to generate interrupt and NMIs. Then we have the address bus section, which contains 16 LEDs and 16 switches. And the data bus section is very similar, but just with 8 switches and 8 LEDs instead. The difference with Altair is that the address and data switches are separated. The memory access section is almost a copy of the Altair examin and deposit functionality. If the read switch is flipped upwards, data is read from the address given by the switches. When flipped downwards, the data is read from the next memory position. This is handy when reading long memory sequences. The right switch works in the same way. The CPU control section contains reset, clock generation control and single stopping functionality. The clock generation control has a run halt switch and a dial for continuous variation of the clock speed. A three-way switch for 100 Hz, 10 kHz and 1 MHz, yielding a total frequency span from 1 Hz to 1.5 MHz approximately. The single stepping functionality comes in two different flavors. One can step a single clock cycle at a time and thus observe instruction fetch and memory accesses, but it is also possible to step one instruction at a time. This latter functionality is possible with the selected CPU of the system the 65CO2. I'll go into more detail about that later. Back to the architecture. The user interface boards support one panel section each. So if we populate the front side with these boards, we get the displayed arrangement. In this picture, the user interface board have been split up into different boards, a proper user interface board and a panel board. The reason for this will be evident in episode three, where we'll be discussing the mechanical design. In iteration 1, however, this split will not be present as we don't have the mechanical constraints of the case that comes with iteration 2. Lastly, let's have a quick look at the core of iteration 1 and the key components of the main board. This is the schematic of the main board in iteration 1. It is very, very simple. It only consists of a 65CO2, 
two 32K SRAMs and some logic. Everything else in iteration 1 is allocated to the user interface boards. In episode 0 I made an argument for choosing 6502 based on lower cost and better compute power. I chose the CMOS version of it, the 65CO2, partly because the availability today but also because I wanted to be able to single stop the CPU. That wasn't possible with the original 6502 as it had a minimum clock frequency of a few hundred kilohertz. That in turn was caused by the NMOS process technology used in the original device. Since I chose a cheaper processor and the counterfactual circumstances allows for cheaper memory, I spend it all on maximizing the memory to 64K. We now have the entire memory map covered with SRAM. In iteration 2, the address decode logic will be modified to support inclusion of other memory spaces on top of the 64K space, an approach I will refer to as overloading. This overloading procedure will be discussed in episode 4 when the expansion board interface is specified. The next episode will be split into two parts, 2A and 2B respectively. We will discuss the design of the interface boards and build them on newer boards. We will also build the iteration 1 version of the core system on a breadboard and we will finally start to execute some code. See you next time!